Hi, I'm Jen Gorecki, the CEO and co-founder of Coalition Snow. On any given day, you might find me on the back of a motorcycle in Africa, chipping away at the patriarchy, or playing in the mountains. I'm Jillian Raymond, the co-creator of Juicy Bits and a Coalition Snow ambassador. I'm a high school teacher, and when I'm not in the classroom, you can find me on the mat, on the trail, or skiing 12 months a year around the world. What we've learned over the years is that despite how good that epic powder day or trail ride is, there's still so much more to talk about. So what we're doing is taking those conversations that we start on the chairlift and the trail, and we're delivering them to you in juicy bits every few weeks. As modern outdoor women, we do more than get dirty outside. We are complex, adventurous, and intellectual. And so are you. So subscribe today. Check out our campaign on Patreon and get ready to blush, cry, and maybe pee your pants a little. Juicy Bits is brought to you by Coalition Snow, a women's outdoor company making equipment and apparel designed to deconstruct the status quo. FYI, friends, this podcast contains mature content and may not be appropriate for younger ears. You've been warned and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am so grateful to introduce our guest today, Whitney Fail. She has been backcountry skiing since the 1990s. She has rigged together all sorts of gear to get herself up the mountain and has had all kinds of stories getting herself down the mountain. We're really excited to welcome her to the show. She's not only going to touch on her experiences in the backcountry, but also speak to us about Tahoe Backcountry Women, a community group that she has pulled together to uh, bring a little shine to Lake Tahoe. Whitney? Well, um, thanks for having me. There's so much that's changed since the 1990s. Um, It's really hard to believe. Um, For one, there was no internet, so there was no AVI report. Um, You just kind of went out and went and did things and tried to figure it out on your own. We didn't take AVI 1 classes or AVI 2 classes and we, you know, it wasn't just all organized, and there was old topo maps that Dave Nettle had somehow drawn a little line on that we tried to follow, and so things were very different. Um, the obvious ones are the equipment was ridiculous, laughable. You know, we were building heel risers with the homemade PVC piping that we put a little bungee cord on so we could put it on our boots and you know, drop down and kind of put it in place when we needed it and then take it off from under our boots when we didn't. And so it was quite something. There really weren't any crowds. You'd be alone out there. You'd run into, um, you know, that one weird guy. I'm glad I got to pioneer the, the sport in the 90s. And I was pioneering telemark skiing at the same time. So um, it was it was quite an experience. Being a woman in the 90s, pioneering the sport you know I usually just went out with my guy friends and a lot of times they just sort of left me in the dust and uh, I had to figure things out for myself I was super lucky because I had a a woman who mentored me and and taught me mountaineering skills and and taught me to use an ice axe and crampons and said you you know you got to come along you gotta you gotta come do this thing and I was young and I was like "Uh, okay and you know I followed her around and she teamed up with a bunch of guys and it was usually just her and I and a bunch of guys and you know what in reflecting back on it it was something special but uh, I wouldn't wouldn't trade it for my fat skis now, that's for sure. So Whitney, one of the things that's changed over the years is the involvement of women in the backcountry. And in 2011, you started Tahoe Backcountry Women. Why did you start this group? What's it all about? And how have you seen it evolve over time? Well, um, I took a year off from teaching. Uh, I got a little burnt out. I teach history usually in, in public school. And I... I just wanted to do something different, so I got a a job in the outdoor industry, and so I kind of started being a first-hand player in very male-dominated industry, and I also had a lot of time to go skiing in the morning, and I was sort of looking for more and more partners to do that. I had a lot more time to ski from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., and I was looking for someone else who had that schedule, which is weird. But And then, you know, I had heard about ladies' nights that local shops had put on and things, and 
And I just thought, well, let's just get the ladies together and see what happens. And and that was really the first uh, meeting was just sort of like, hey, does anybody want to get together for this group? And then, you know, 80 people showed up. And I thought, okay, well, there's a need for that. Now I got to go figure out what it's going to be. Um, and I'm still not exactly sure what it is. I do know it's a community organization made up of women who like to backcountry ski and ride. And, you know, how it's evolved is is I've got a, a bunch of women on my side as a leadership team, and they've volunteered their time and energy to uh, make this thing happen. And we get together and we decide on what events we want to have during the season. And if we're lucky, we get out to go skiing together. And I like where it's going, but it's it's definitely a lot of work and I couldn't do it alone. Um, so I'm super grateful for everyone who's been involved in keeping it going. And yeah, I don't, you know, I could go into the different events and stuff, but, you know, backcountry, Tahoe Backcountry Women is really about whoever shows up on that night or that day and wants to participate. It's not a set group of women who always are the same and it's a club and you have to belong and you pay dues. It's nothing like that. It's really just we make it up as we go along and we see who shows up and then we have experiences with those women that show up and then we move on to the next thing. And so that's, dare I say, it's organically growing. So yeah, and I hope that it continues to do so. Uh, so, Whitney, recently Tahoe Backcountry Women hosted a fantastic event in Tahoe with ski mountaineer Caroline Gleick, and it was exclusively for women. Why only women? It's a really good question, and I thought a lot about it because, frankly, I knew you were going to ask it. <laughs> so, I, I've gone around in circles in my head, and I just... You know, I think what I came to in the end was that our events and our gatherings, they don't so much exclude men, like it's not an exclusion thing as it is that it includes women more. So it's a, um, you know, I don't want to think of it as like, oh, well, you exclude guys. That doesn't seem fair. And, you know, this whole business and you've hurt feelings and stuff. And, you know, I'm terribly sorry about that. But I just... I think when you put women together without the presence of men, um, something different happens that that maybe people don't understand. And um, if I could try to explain it, it would be that I want to put women's voices first and foremost, and I want to put their experiences in the front of the stage and not have men be there, frankly, because it's about women, their voices, their experiences and things like that. So... What ends up happening in the field out in the backcountry with the absence of men is that women are forced to be the leaders. There's no way around it. There's going to be a woman leading because there's no men there. And so it builds leadership in that way when you're forced to take on that. Um, All the decisions in the backcountry are women's decisions. You know, if you have a good time, it's a woman's fault. If you have a bad time, it's a woman's fault. If you're making decisions together, they're women's decisions. Sometimes It's harder, actually. You know, honestly, if I want to relax a little, I'll go out with a bunch of guys. I'll follow them around. I'll let them make all the decisions. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to say anything. I'll just be like, yeah, whatever you guys want to do, because it's just easier just to be that way than to, you know, try to to wedge my voice into the decision making process or to give my opinion on something or or whatever. I've been more demanding lately because my highest priority is a good powder run or a good ski run. And so if I think that the decisions are being made where um, I'm not going to get the best possible (laughs) ski run I can get, then I'm going to speak up for sure. Or if I feel like I'm in some kind of danger, uh, avalanche or otherwise. So I think it forces women to take on leadership roles in ways that are apparent to us, but maybe need explaining to others. I'm not sure. So, Whitney, in touching on the exclusivity for women and sort of the best way to say, sorry, dudes, ladies only, what I heard from you is this opportunity for women to be in positions of leadership and really to make space for their voices. And I think that is not only important for us in the skin track, um, on the top of the ridges, making the hard decisions, but I think that's also a, a bigger picture. So really well said. I appreciate that. 
Uh, yeah, and I'd just like to add one thing there, and that's um, that, you know, I have had guys come and say, you know, oh, I'd like to come to that slideshow, or I'd like to come to that event. Um, and then I, I almost question their motives of why do they want to come. And, it's, uh, and I've even had jokes like, I want to come because it's a room full of awesome outdoor adventure women. And frankly, I'm looking for a date or I want to pick one up or, you know, it's like, so I kind of question like, well, why do you guys want to come? Do they really want to come and listen to women's experiences like genuinely? Then that's awesome. Maybe in the future we should have a mixed event and see who comes. And, and I'm not opposed to that. I think we should have a mixed event in the future um, once we get our, you know, our, our solid feet on the ground. But I just, I wonder, you know, we've had a couple of guys show up at our events like accidentally and they're kind of like, sit in the back and we've even had like a couple of creepers like who's that guy who's he with like we don't even know so I definitely I, I question a little bit what the motive would be for going to an event filled with women yeah and as women there's times that we're definitely also looking for men uh, everyone wants a little something something here and there but the point of creating these spaces is that they're safe and that women can go to them without worrying or having to think about, am I going to get picked up on? How do I navigate this? Because sometimes you just want to go and hang out and you don't want to have to be on. And not everything has to be about sex and you don't want to be objectified in everything that you do. So one of the other ways to talk about why only women would be is is because that creates a safe space. And now more than ever, or perhaps always, women need safe spaces. And that's something really special that women's only groups can provide. It's not to say that being with men is unsafe, uh, but it's different. So Tahoe Women's Backcountry and other women's specific groups create that safe space. Now with that said, we also know that there are plenty of men out there who are allies. So Whitney, I'm, I'm curious, how do you think we can spot them? How can we bring these men into not just backcountry skiing, but maybe even life in, in general? Because when we consider reaching gender equity, women will never be able to do it alone. And we actually need those allies. So can you talk a little bit about this? God knows what without them. But yeah, I love men. I ski with men all the time. Um, I have so many men in my life and I know so many men that are so supportive of myself, the group, um, supportive in the field, out on the mountains. And I think when you talk about male allies, I think that it exists sort of on a continuum, on a spectrum. It's a sort of a spectrum of support um, where it could just be a little bit or it could be a lot. And it also exists in like a time and place context, right? Like what kind of support and in what ways and what are you up to and what are you doing? Are you in the field? Are you having an event? Things like that. In the field, when, you know, when we're in the mountains and we're, we're backcountry skiing, it's super important to have guys listen to you and, and take your opinions uh, and your decision making seriously and include you. And, and in that way, they show respect just by doing that. And it could be just little things that happen. Um, one time uh, years ago, I was uh, lucky enough to be at Alta Ski Area in Utah um, on a powder day. And they opened the gates to go ski um, an untracked area. And there was a big line of people and somehow I managed to be in the very front of this line and I knew being in the front of this line like I had to go after it and just um, sidestep and traverse across this thing as fast as I could and I was huffing and puffing and I turned around at one point and I just saw like a whole line of guys behind me I mean my girlfriend was right behind me she was huffing and puffing like go 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 and I was like can I do it because it was pretty far to get out to the bowl where we were going and and I'm like can I keep this pace up can I do it should I you know what should I do here and I I kind of just for a split second sort of paused and kind of gave a side eye to the guy behind my friend friend and he looked at me and he said you go girl you are doing great like you just keep going and I was like yeah that's right I am going fast enough I am gonna do this I am gonna be the first person down this bowl and um you know that's you know, he was he was a real ally just in that moment he didn't he didn't try to get around me and oh you're not going fast enough and oh I gotta get it before you do and that you know he recognized that I was leading the pack and I should be leading the pack 
and he encouraged me to keep leading the pack. So, um, you know, it's just little things like that. Um, I've also noticed when I'm out in the mountains, guys who will stop and, and ask me directions or ask me advice or or ask me something. And I kind of am even taken back in that moment, like, oh, ooh, so you're asking me? Are you sure you don't want to ask a guy next to me or whatever? And s- sometimes, you know, I am really approachable. So maybe it's that like m- my husband maybe would just be like not even around or just not even wanting to talk to anyone. So maybe there's a little bit of that going on. But just that respect of being like, no, your opinion matters. I think you're skilled. And you know, in the 90s, it was just me, myself and I kind of thing when the guys would go off ahead of me, I had to do a lot of positive self talk. But the fact that they were willing to go with me, right on the spectrum of support, you know, once we were out there, they didn't really support me that much, or they were way ahead of me. But, but just the fact that they were like, yeah, you should come, you should come ski Mount Shasta with us, you can do it or what wherever we were going. But in the community, too, with our gatherings and stuff, we're fully supported by many shops in our local community um, and many people who work at those shops in our local community. And so it could be as, as small as, yeah, we'll promote your event or as big as, no, we'll sponsor it. So there's lots, you know, in the spectrum or it could be just a little comment that you come across in the mountains. I'm a way of communicating or it could be as big as, you know, no, we're going to pay for the whole thing. That's how much we're going to support you or whatever. So um, that's what I kind of meant by spectrum or continuum. and, And there's lots of ways to spot allies. You know, Whitney, we've had a lot of great days in the backcountry together, and I I can picture, you know, those male allies that you're speaking of because we skied with them together, and you and I have had some really great days while we've been skiing in the backcountry now four-plus years. And I, you know, I always wonder when you're picking your partners, do you consider their feelings about objective skiing? And, you know what, maybe actually before you get into that, can you give us some background on exactly what we mean by objective skiing? Well, objective skiing seems like a term that's come about quite recently. I don't know if I'm wrong about that, but I just it, it's popping up more and more just even in the last a couple of years, at least maybe that's just since since I've I've been tuned into it. Um, and, I, and I think part of it is that it's been brought about by, Um, social media outlets a little bit sort of promoting this idea of we're going to go ski this kuar we're going to go ski this line and um, and then we're going to post about it and um, we're going to promote that we did it or whatever and that and that's fine and I feel like I did a lot of objective skiing in the 1990s you know we're going to go ski Mount Hood well you're going to go ski Mount Hood that's the objective you're going to go ski Mount St. Helens okay well let's try to get up to it in those days we talked about it like summit fever like you've got to get to the summit um, and and what are the risks involved in making sure you get to the summit and that's the highest objective and so you see that more with accessible lines in the backcountry and as the backcountry gets more crowded and more popular and is popularized by social media people promote you know certain lines and then uh, someone wants to go ski it they have this plan you know that's their objective um, and that's fine if that's what they want to do. I personally think there's a little bit more risk involved in that because part of minimizing risk is being able to change the plan uh, at a moment's notice. And um, you have to be able to uh, let the objective go if necessary. And, ha- and how much are you going to hold on to the objective? Um, even if the conditions get serious, there's avi conditions or other dangerous conditions. So personally for me, where, where I'm at right now is I said this before I'll say it again because it's really important to me is I want the best possible ski turn runs that you know I want the best turns I bet I want the best snow conditions that I can possibly get and sometimes with objective skiing it's not about ideal conditions it is about the objective of climbing that couloir and skiing down whatever the conditions are and that can be a great challenge too you know like I did that thing the conditions sucked but I did it you know it's like well good for you I'm gonna be over here on the side skiing this other really good run or whatever so for where I'm at in my life I have a little bit less of objective skiing um, and a little bit more looking for the best run possible and I've kind of made it uh, recently in the last maybe since I even started this group I've really uh, become a better leader at finding the best conditions and uh, making that high priority. And so if the conditions are right, 
and you have an objective, that's that's the payoff. That's when you're just like, you've had the best day ever. You have met your objective and you got really good skiing. And um, that's really fun. I, I really like it when that happens. So Whitney, our time is coming to an end here, but we want to be able to leave all of our listeners with a parting thought. So much of what you've discussed today is around the culture in the backcountry and how women can be a part of creating that culture. Something that I know that's important to you and inspires you is shine theory. Will you tell us a little bit about this to close out the show today? Yeah, sure. It's um, it's kind of funny because I just sort of heard this catchphrase shine theory um, last week, and now I'm sort of obsessed with it. But just because someone names something doesn't mean that it, that it wasn't around before. So it's obviously been an idea. Someone just put a name to it. And it came to me through an article in Free Skier Magazine um, this week that was written about the Revelstoke community of women, a backcountry skier community in Revelstoke. And the the author of the, the article was talking about shine theory. And I mean, you know, I'm not saying the women of, of Revelstoke are sitting around going, yeah, we're going we're gonna to start this shine theory thing. I mean, it's not like that per say, but it's this idea that through support and mentorship and promoting uh, women as, as a general group that um, you can get farther than being competitive and being cutthroat and being individualistic. And I, I think it was utilized in the Obama administration by some aides who were trying to get more women in the cabinet, frankly, in government, and wanted to try to, you know, to put this theory to use. Like, I mean, that's why I guess it's called a theory is because, you know, let's see if it works. Like, let's support each other let's get together, let's empower each other, let's inspire each other, let's uh, support each other in our education um, and in our communities. And, and what will happen, or what's supposed to happen based on the theory, is that it uplifts women in general, and you do create more leaders in the community, which is what we, we definitely need. So I, so I am, uh, I like that. I mean, that's why I started Tahoe Backcountry Women. I wasn't calling it shine theory at the time, like I said, but I like that term. I'm going to start saying shine on. I can't thank you enough, um, not only for taking some time to talk with us today, but, you know, honestly, for all you've taught me and being a mentor to me in the backcountry, truly grateful for you. And um, that wraps up our show today. You can find out more about Tahoe Backcountry Women. Find them on Instagram at Tahoe Backcountry Women and on Facebook. And remember, we want to hear from you, our listeners, because there are two lips to every labia. Until next time.